Welcome to this new interview, the latest in a series of video podcasts about the new Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists Online. The Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, or ESDA as we call it, uh, went live on July 1st. It is the Seventh-day Adventist Church's first online reference work, and it features thousands of articles from around the world on a wide variety of topics. If you haven't checked the ESDA website yet, please do so. Please go to encyclopedia.adventist.org. That's encyclopedia.adventist.org. And browse thousands of articles and photographs and hundreds of videos about people, institutions, beliefs, and organizations, the full panoply of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. I am Dr. David Trim, editor of the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, and with me is Dr. Dragoslava Sandrak, uh, the managing editor of ESDA, and we are your hosts today. And our guests today are Elder Gideon Reneke, the executive secretary for the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and the consultant editor for ESDA for that division. Also with us is Dr. Pasmore Hachalinga, the director of the Ellen G. White Research and Heritage Center at Helderberg College near Cape Town in South Africa, who is the editor for ESDA for the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division. Gideon Passmore, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Dr. Trim. It's a privilege to be with you and Dr. Sandra. Elder Annika, please tell us something about your role in the ESDA project. Is it something that you enjoy? Dr. Trim, I mean, first of all, I mean, the, my role was and is, I mean, consultant editor. And uh, this is, I mean, working with our executive secretaries across the, uh, the division. <clears throat> so with a lot of the union executive secretaries, because they in turn, you know, look for authors and they, they assist in the process. And absolutely, I mean, what a, what a joy and what a privilege to have been part of this and to be part of this. And uh, we must be honest that um, many of the people, I think, have gotten the, the spirit of, you know, um, you know getting involved. Uh, it took some time, but uh, I think, I mean, more and more people are enjoying to be part of this. And Dr. Hachalinga, tell us about your role in the project. Well, I came to Cape Town in November 2016. And when I came here, I found a list already prepared, a list of articles by my predecessor, Dr. Sokupa. So my role was to begin searching or looking for authors um, I turned to my consulting editor, Elder Reneke, to get the help of the executive secretaries in the unions to assist with the recruiting authors, assigning the articles to the authors that they recommended. And with the help of Elder Reneke and the union executive secretaries, uh, we began to do the research and then uh, uh, proceeded to writing and editing and then submitting some of the articles. Of course, there was a delay in the sense that uh, I still had some you know, issues to settle in Angola and that uh, delayed our whole process. But uh, when I came back, we picked up speed and it has been a joyful experience. And we probably should have said uh, that the initial editor for uh, ESDA for the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division was Dr. Michael Sukupa, who was Dr. Hachalinga's predecessor at Helderberg, uh, and then moved to the LMG White Estate headquarters in the United States. Uh, but uh, Dr. Hachalinga has been in place now for quite a bit longer than Dr. Sukupa and we're very grateful to you for what you've done. But, you know, you highlighted something there, talking about the role of bringing in executive secretaries of unions, 
not everyone is so familiar with Adventist church structure, um, the quick explanation is that these are senior administrators of the church. And that highlights the importance of administrators. Elder Reinecke, you're an administrator yourself, but you are passionate about Adventist history, I believe. Um, what would you say or recommend to church administrators, uh, maybe in your own division who are watching and are thinking, oh, we don't have many articles in my country yet, or indeed church administrators elsewhere, um, is their help important and how can they help? Yes, Dr. Tim, I mean, um, absolutely. I mean, I am passionate about Adventist history. Um, and, and one thing, I mean, that uh, for many years, I, I remember when I was a young man uh, reading Psalm 78, uh, verse 3 and 4 and 6 to 8, where God says, uh, tell God's wonderful works to, from one generation to another generation so that they will believe and not be, um, you know, hard-headed like their, like their uh, forefathers. And so in that, I saw a calling you know, and I think this is a calling, Dr. Trim, Dr. Sandrak, uh, for, for everyone, I mean, in the Adventist church to say it's a calling to preserve and to tell the story of God. Um, mm -hmm. You know, many times people say, I mean, it's history. It's his, with a capital mm -hmm. H, his mm -hmm. story that we are telling. Mm -hmm. So it's a, yes. it's a calling, Dr. Trim, that I mm -hmm. feel that leaders should lead, obviously, by example. If they if they see this as a calling that we should mm. pen, well, you know, that's the old term, pen, mm. but I mean, capture, you know, God's works. <clears throat> and then, I mean, to have it online, you know, so that people, whenever they read, and whether they are young believers, whether they are children, uh, there are many opportunities, you know, for, for people to use this. So I think it's, it's part of God's calling in the first place. Yes. But secondly, I mean, it's, it's part of mission. You know, to for for people to to hear of God and to say, but this is a wonderful God that has that has had His hand, you know, in the dealings of people and this part of the territory. So I want to get to know this wonderful God better. Mm -hmm. um, yes. So I think it's part of mission, and I think it's you know, in the Seventh Day Adventist Church we have a, a, a program called called Revival and Reformation. I think it's reviving the hearts of people that might have gone a little bit cold or maybe even have you know, stopped coming to church. But if they read these stories, I believe that their faith can be rekindled and they, they, they can return to God. So I, mean, I think there is, on so many levels, there, there are mm. such um, wonderful opportunities. But, yes, for yes. Leaders, but for leaders... You know, if, if, they, if they believe in God's calling and if they believe that they need to share God's story uh, of, in our territory, I think, uh, you know, they will, they will put it on agendas all the time. They will, wherever they travel, they will be talking about this. They will be recruiting uh, authors. So I think it's a passion that needs to be found in the hearts of our leaders. Yes, yes. But Pastor Renike, thank you so much for mentioning Psalm 78. It, it, it is such an inspiring psalm. And as you said, there is God's calling for us to keep the story of his blessing, of his leadings, of his people alive. Otherwise, if we forget these stories, we forget our roots, we forget who we are. And eventually our hearts will grow cold because God will become, I believe, just a theory, uh, a, a very dry doctrine detached from, from real life. And, and uh, you mentioned the stories, the significance of telling the stories to people, how God acted in real life. And this is something that every person, young and old, can relate to, God in real life, uh, uh, in, the, in the far past and in the more recent past. So, um, Pastor, would you, would you share with us some stories from your territory that touched you or perhaps surprised you? Dr. Hachalinga, you as well. Yeah, thank you very much, Dr. Sandrak. Um, maybe to add a little more from uh, the previous question, uh, while 
I was still waiting for articles to come from the unions. I jumped in and uh, com completed the three articles, uh, you know, on my own. Of course, I had the other people to, to do peer reviewing. And I found that uh, there was much that I didn't know from, you know, the history of our church in Southern Africa. I, I found it also very interesting uh, to, to learn the stories of, you know, how our pioneers, you know, worked in those old days when, you know, a lot, you know, uh, was not yet, uh, you know, done. There were no roads, no railway lines, you know, no airplanes, you know, they had to go, you know, by foot. I found that thing very interesting. And uh, I was also involved in uh, looking for peer reviewers. I'm glad to report that, uh, you know, my three division officers have also been involved in peer reviewing, which was a very good support for me. Now, some of the stories that, uh, you know, intrigued me a lot. Of course, I wrote an article on the... Uh, Peter Vessels, who was a, a farmer, a layman in Kimberley, right in the Midlands in South Africa, who had a, a passionate desire to know the truth as a youth. And he always, uh, you know, went to his mother to try to find out, but his mother also didn't know much. So he was a member of the Dutch Reformed Church, and uh, he, he was uh, kind of having a lot of questions because there were other churches, you know, mushrooming around the country. So he wondered why there were so many, you know, denominations and yet one Bible. Uh, and then he, he also had the poor health. And then he, that also kind of brought the discouragement to him. And uh, one time there was a, uh, a preacher from America, a revivalist who was, uh, you know, telling the people that uh, the miracles that used to happen in the time of the apostles can still happen even today. But he was, uh, Peter Vessels was not able to attend, but his brother Philip attended and he came back with a, a pamphlet which uh, was uh, emphasizing the promise found in James chapter 5, verse 13 and, uh, to 15, you know, especially emphasizing on the fact that, uh, you know, the prayer of faith will heal the sick. So he decided to look up the text, and then he, he, he decided that uh, if this was true, he was going to pray and see if God was going to heal him. And for sure, when he did that, uh, before he went to sleep one night, when he woke up the following day, he felt much better. He felt, he, you know, he was healed. Mm -hmm. So he went to tell his wife, he went to tell his mother, and, uh, you know, his, his confidence in the Bible was revived, you know. But then later on, uh, he was discussing with his uh, brother, uh, John, about uh, you know, praying for the sick you know, to be healed. Mm -hmm. But his brother, who was also a deacon in their church, he said, well, uh, these things no longer happen. But if you think uh, you are a Bible man, why do you keep it Sunday instead of Saturday, which is the true Sabbath? So he felt challenged. He says, no, Sunday is the, the true Sabbath. He says, well, uh, look at the calendar. What does it say? Which, one, which day is the seventh? So he looked at it for sure. The calendar was showing that the Saturday was the seventh. So he went back to his Bible and he studied and found that, uh, you know, the Sabbath was never changed. So he decided that he was going to start keeping the Sabbath. And he thought that he was the only one in the whole world who was keeping the seventh day as the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. But then it didn't take long. He met 
uh, another farmer by the name of George Van Bruten. And in their discussion, they discovered that uh, George also had decided to keep the Sabbath. And uh, George's uh, beginning of keeping the Sabbath really emanated from studies that he had held with uh, an American miner by the name of William Hunt. So George led Peter Vessels to William Hunt, and then he, they learned more truths from William Hunt. And William Hunt, you know, indicated to them that in, in America there, 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 there is a denomination with 30,000 Sabbath keepers. Right. So that kind of, you know, uh, energized their interest. Right. They wanted so that's... to connect. So that's how you get the first Sabbath keepers, Seventh-day Sabbath keepers in South Africa. That's right. Mm. Yeah. But of course, before that, uh, when uh, William Hunt arrived in South Africa around 1878, he had started witnessing. And one of those uh, who was converted was, uh, um, uh, was Wilson, a man by the name of Wilson who also wrote a letter to the general conference, but he never received a response. So seven years later, 1895, 1896, we have now George Van Druten and William uh, Peter Vessels, with the help of William Hunt, they wrote a letter to the general conference asking for a missionary to be sent to come and baptize them. Mm -hmm. And in the... Uh, with the letter, they included the 50 pounds to assist with the missionary <laughs> travel expenses. Mm. So, that so they were is generous, in fact. They were, uh, mm. and, and actually, that's a large part of the importance of Peter Vessels, that he had yes. disposable income, which he put at the, at the uh, disposal of the church, right? Yes. I, I think uh, that already indicated their generosity and their willingness to uh, to contribute to the advancing of God's work. Because say, after the missionaries had come, which was now in July 1887, a few years later, diamonds were found at uh, Peter's, at one of uh, the farms for Peter's father. And right. when they saw the, this farm, they got in, you know, a lot of money, which they used largely to support in the establishment of the church in South Africa. But they also made the contributions to, uh, to Battle Creek uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Kellogg when he was uh, opening a centurion in Chicago. Right. They donated some money also to Europe and also to Australia when Erin White was there. You know, she borrowed the money from Mrs. Vessels, about 1,000 pounds. So their a generosity, their willingness to sacrifice for the work really helped to establish the Seventh-day Adventist Church in South Africa. Oh, that's wonderful. And it sort of highlights uh, providence, the role of providence. Yes. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd, I, I, I would be one who wouldn't believe that God sent illness to Peter Vessels, but because uh, I don't believe myself that God uh, ever does anything uh, directly ill to us, except perhaps as a, a punishment, as in the case of Israel. But God takes the miseries that result from our, us living in a sinful world and our own bad actions, and by his wonderful providence, transmutes them into... Uh, into gold for his kingdom, um, or in Peter Vessel's case, literal diamonds, which then funded the church. So that's a, that's a fantastic story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, and, and we read uh, some other stories in the ESDA as well of people discovering God's truth, we would say almost by chance, by uh, yeah. seeing a, a pamphlet or, or, or uh, advertisement but it was the work of the Holy Spirit that prepared the soil for the missionaries, Adventist missionaries, even before they came to certain regions. And yes. this only shows that the mission is truly God's work and done by, by His Spirit and not human work. 
yes. so this is this is an amazing story dr hatchling thank you and, for sharing it and and these are this is just one story of course but these the, mm. there are many stories like this and you know the readers can read the esdra i think in different ways one is just to read the story or a second would be just to read it for facts for say a college student writing a paper a researcher but i think people can also read it and try sort of as it were to read between the lines and see the broader picture that is emerging of god's church and the way that god interacts with it elder reinecker what are some stories that touched you or perhaps surprised you Yes, Dr. Trim, I mean, two, just two quick ones. I mean, uh, the one is Bongo Mission. Uh, that's the place where the work started in Angola. Um, to personally visit Bongo Mission <clears throat> and to see, I mean, how God had kept his hand over Bongo Mission, even through a 27-year civil war that Angola had gone through, and how um, Bongo Mission is now reliving or, you know, being, um, you know, starting up the work again. But I mean, to be, to stand there, and I mean, I, I was touched, I mean, to see God's providence again. Another story uh, that touched me, I mean, and a place that I personally visited was standing in the graveyard um, at Seleucia University um, to see, uh, and, and the people that tell the story, Dr. Trim, and they, and they point to the place where the marsh or the swamp was, the, the troublesome swamp where the mosquitoes bred, um, you know, that caused the malaria for the missionaries. But to stand there and to say, well, you know, it wasn't only adults that sacrificed, but it was young children. It was teenagers. It was, it was children that also died, I mean, with parents, you know, in, in spreading the wonderful works of God. Um, you know, that really touched me. I mean, those two places, Bongo Mission and, um, and Seleucia University, I mean, standing in the graveyard, those really touched my heart. It's been a very good conversation, and we wish we had more time. Perhaps we can record another podcast with you again uh, in, in, in a, a couple of months' time, perhaps. Um, where do things stand? Is the work on articles for the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division done, or is there more to do? There is still more to do. Um, the, of course, uh, the challenge has been in, the, the authors have had challenges in finding sources, finding information. This actually drove me to have to assist the authors in doing research. As such, whatever article we received, whether it was like written like a letter, you know, I involved myself in finding sources and helping the authors so that, you know, the article will be suitable to, you know, to publish. As such, we have not re rejected any article. We have helped the authors to ensure that uh, um, the articles become, you know, better. Of course, the limitations that we had uh, involves, uh, you know, citing the minutes, committee minutes. Uh, the minutes are not yet online, so we cannot have access uh, to the minutes and to the reports uh, and such documents. But uh, in Conducting interviews has also been very helpful. So far, we have uh, only uh, submitted about 40 articles, close to 40 articles. But we still have many uh, that are still in the first stages. Uh, normally, when I receive an article, I go through it. I raise some questions where they need to add some more information. Some of the authors never come back after that because they, they get stuck with the finding information. Yeah, but uh, we are still making quite some good progress. Um, that is uh, where we are. And so that should be encouraging for anyone who would want to write yes. because you don't, and the, the interesting thing is, um, to interrupt my train of thought, but all around the world we have authors who've never written for scholarly publications before. We even have people who've never published before. 
And the reality is that in certain parts of the world, including uh, large parts of Southern Africa, Indian Ocean Division, uh, there will be people who, who are not experienced authors, but they have perspective and insights that somebody in another part of the world won't have. And so we want sure. them to write. And so we appreciate very much, Dr. Hatchelinga, the work you've done to help them. Um, how can more people be encouraged to get involved, Elder Reineke? Dr. Trim, I think, I mean, on, on a number of ways, it, well, in a number of ways, I mean, they can be involved. But the one thing, I mean, for, for SID, uh, we, this is so important uh, to us that we have included it uh, in our strategic objectives, in our strategic plan for at least the next five years. Wow. The ESDA project is so important that we want to keep it before the people. So we, we are going to accelerate the, 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 um, the sourcing of authors and encouraging exactly what you say, you know, encouraging normal people, I mean, ordinary people, to write what they know about God's work you know, in SID. So, and we will be, we will be encouraging leaders, um, you know, wherever we travel, and keep it on agendas, uh, you know, in meetings, on a regular basis, for sure. Yes. Yes, and if I may add, uh, Dr. Hachalinga mentioned that uh, for some parts of the world, uh, some regions, there are no uh, sources to cite and, and really much written materials to conduct research. And I think this is where the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists comes, and that's where our contribution is seen, that some as the articles will be perhaps the first written resources, accounts of the history for certain uh, places and regions uh, that will capture the stories through interviews and perhaps going through uh, letters that uh, church members keep and, and some photographs and uh, unpublished manus manuscripts. So um, I think this, is, this should be an encouraging process. Uh, otherwise, these stories, if they are not recorded now, they would be forgotten forever. And this is uh, where the encyclopedia has its contribution. And I think it should be encouraging for people to say, if there are no resources, if there is nothing written, let this article be this memory, this first start, this first written record for the future generations and serve as a basis for future researchers as well. Oh. That, that is very true. Some of the authors, uh, you know, are nurses, some are accountants, some are teachers, mm -hmm. uh, treasurers. You know, everyone has been involved and uh, it has been exciting for them to see their articles published. Now they can access them online and they are really very happy. Uh, we have been receiving messages from those who are accessing the website and reading. Uh, they are very, very happy and I'm sure in the future, researching is going to be much, much easier with the resources being there online for them. So, in fact, ESDA is making history as well as recording history. Uh, and it's enabling, and this is true in your territory, but also elsewhere, it is enabling uh, the collection of oral histories, uh, the gathering of things, of records that were not in church headquarters, but were in people's homes, and yes. it's a stimulus for that. And, uh, you know, I personally uh, praise God for that, that that is happening. Um, and it is a source of, of some gratification to, uh, to yes. us in the main office. Uh, but, of course, none of it could happen without our partners on the ground and without mm -hmm. our local authors. Um, Elder Reineke, Dr. Hachalinga, you, without you, we couldn't be doing this. Likewise, with our other consultant and regional editors around the world. Anything you would like to share with our viewers, those listening to us, readers of the encyclopedia, anything you would like to share as we come to an end? Yeah, personally, I, I have become very much interested in history. Uh, when I went to college back in the early 80s, I think I learned more about American, you know, history of our church. But now, it's now when I'm catching up to learn the history of our church within our region. So, 
I begin to understand my church better because, uh, you know, it kind of uh, gives you confidence, it shapes your identity, and the, the experience that uh, those who haven't published before have had, you know, in writing these articles have really, you know, excited them and have educated them more about, you know, our church. So we are still, you know, appealing for more authors. We are also appealing for those who can do peer reviewing. Uh, we still have a number of articles and the exercise is very much interesting. I'm sure they are going to learn a lot and also gain wonderful experience. It also, you know, strengthens your faith, you know, to see how God has been working in our past history. So we are still open. We are appealing for authors and those who can assist us in peer reviewing are very much welcome. Dr. Trim, I mean, from my side, I mean, I can just... Um you know, say amen, I mean, to what Dr. Achilinga has been saying. We, we want to um, take this opportunity, I mean, for people to write the stories of what God has done in our territory. So everyone, I mean, can be part of this. This is a wonderful opportunity for us to write our stories uh, of our territory. And secondly, I mean, I think it's a wonderful resource for on so many levels for instance you know a, a grandfather like me um that can um you know go online for sabbath closing for sabbath opening with the grandchildren you know and read stories you know so that so that it's an interesting sabbath opening or a, a sabbath closing i think it's a wonderful resource you know for so many things for sermons for talks um you know um, so it's an opportunity and it's a wonderful resource. So we would like people, I mean, to, to either contribute or to use this wonderful resource. Mm. Mm. Elder Annika, Dr. Hachalinga, thank you so much for the work you have done on the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists. Uh, we pray it brings tremendous blessings for the church in your territory and, of course, beyond. And thank you also for being with us today, for making the time in your busy schedules to be with us and to talk so frankly and inspiringly about your role and about the value you see for the encyclopedia. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. You're, you're welcome, and thank you so much for working with us, Dr. Trim and Dr. Sendrick, uh, to make this possible. We have been talking today with the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists, editors for the Southern Africa Indian Ocean region. Uh, Gideon Reineke, the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division Executive Secretary and ESDA Consultant Editor for the Territory, and Dr. Pasmo Hatralinga, the ESDA Regional Editor. Please read the articles from Southern Africa and the Indian Ocean that are in the encyclopedia and check more than 2,000 other articles from around the world at encyclopedia.adventist.org. We'll see you again soon with more ESDA editors and authors and more new stories from the Encyclopedia of Seventh-day Adventists Online. Thanks for being with us. God bless.